Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral. My name is Barbara Ridpath, and I am director of the St. Paul's Institute, the organizer of this evening's event. Some of you may be aware that the inspiration for this evening was the 20th anniversary celebration for women clergy held here last May. You may also have noticed that on Monday of this week, the meeting, at the meeting of the General Synod, the National Assembly of the Church of England, there was a vote in favor of the ordination of women as bishops. If you add yesterday's attempt by the Prime Minister to make it appear he was increasing the presence of women in the Cabinet, it would then be difficult to find a more appropriate time and place for this meeting of women in leadership than this cathedral in this city on this evening. May all of us join in celebrating the successful efforts of our colleagues, our friends, and our sisters. The concept of this evening's event is to get people to work across disciplines, politics, clergy, business, and NGOs in order to share strategies and techniques to improve the position of women as leaders in their chosen fields. As is my inclination in all matters, whether political, church, or family related, but no more so than on the subject of women's empowerment, I believe that what unites us is infinitely more important than what divides us, and that we will be stronger together than any of us can be separately. To that end, we have tried to work with a large cross-section of institutions and organizations to put together tonight's event, including the networking that will follow which should enable you to take the inspiration you get from our speakers and find ways to put your energies to constructive use. I would very much like to thank EY, the Trades Union Congress, the Young Foundation, Liberty, the National Union of Students, Women in the Church, City Women Network, Women First, and the Women's Resource Center for their support. I would like to thank all the staff of the Cathedral and the Institute who have been so supportive in putting together and getting out the word for an event of this magnitude. And most of all, I would like to thank Hannah Elias, who works for the Institute, whose idea this was, and whose hard work got you all here this evening. You will see from your programs that we have chosen Girls Talk London, a charity connecting women of ages 14 to 25 with mentors and career advice for our collection for the evening. The cathedral is embracing the 21st century, so this collection will be taken by mobile phone. You will see that there is a number to text if you would like to donate. Just after the event, at the entrance to the cathedral, there will be time for networking and learning about a variety of the women's organizations who are helping us put this together. We encourage you to stay for that. We will also be continuing our social media campaign explained on the postcards you have been handed this evening. We will have a selfie station in the back that will permit you to have your photograph taken by our cathedral photographer on your phone or do it on your own phone with a line about what action you will take to promote women leaders. Now I have one small announcement which is that if there are people in the uh, cathedral who are hearing impaired, we do have an induction loop. So if you switch your hearing aids to T, that should help you to hear better and to use it. If you are not hard of hearing and you still can't hear, uh, this is an old building not built exactly for this purpose. So we suggest that often the best hearing is in the back of the main uh, part of the cathedral if you're having trouble and to graciously move if you really can't hear. Now not only are we stronger together, we are also stronger when men understand that giving women equal weight in the world in terms of both opportunity and responsibility is in their interest as well as our own. For this reason, I am absolutely delighted that the very Reverend Dave, Dr. David Eisen, Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, has enthusiastically enthusiastically agreed 
to moderate this evening's session, the first time he has done this for an institute event. The Dean has been actively engaged in energizing all the activities of the cathedral and encouraging the cathedral and the institute's engagement on economic and social issues for which I personally am very grateful. For those of you who don't know him, it is probably also worth mentioning that he is married to a woman priest. Mr. Dean. Thank you very much, Barbara. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Thank you very much, Barbara, for telling me that I was going to be enthusiastic. <laughs> um, one of the delights about being here is that uh, one of our key targets at St. Paul's is to be more diverse as a cathedral. And I'm delighted that in my two years here, we've been able to appoint two women canons ordained and a woman lay canon to help balance up the uh, representation on our chapter. And Barbara, who's just been speaking to you, is another example of being able to find someone who is hugely respected in the financial world in particular, but someone who is also a woman. And we're very glad to be able to support that and will continue to do so. Just want to underline what Barbara said, that this is not about let's get together and have a moan, or even let's get together and have some ideas. It's about let's get inspired and go and do something. So if you can have one thing that you're going to go away and do differently as a result of this evening, then it will have been a good evening. The format for the event is this. We have four speakers who are going to speak to us initially for about 10 minutes each. If they go on for too long, I shall start chuntering. You have been warned. Um, and they've been asked to take different perspectives on this topic, so they won't be repeating what they're saying, but they're coming at it from four different perspectives, and they'll tell you about those uh, when their turn comes to speak. Uh, while they're speaking, and as we begin the panel discussion which follows, you are encouraged to ask questions, and in your program, there is a sheet of paper which on one side you can sign up to the organizations here to hear more if you wish. On the other, there is a place to write down questions. Write down your question and hold your question in the air and one of our assistants will come and gently relieve you of it and take it to the back where the questions will be coordinated. Don't forget to write your name down on it because we will be asking some people to come to the microphone and to read out their questions. Um, you'll be given back your piece of paper just in case you've forgotten what your question was. Um, so please do use that facility. You can also ask questions more anonymously through Twitter by using the hashtag WomenLeaders. So if you want to ask a Twitter question or more than one, again, you're very welcome to do that. I'm hoping that my computer here will spring to life at some stage and tell me what your questions are so we can get on and discuss them. At the end, Shami Chakrabarti, who's not on the platform, will be giving us a 10-minute reflection on what she's heard and where she's coming from. Shami has a meeting uh, overlapping with this, but is coming on at about half past seven or so. And then we'll have some time for networking before we have to close down the cathedral so the staff can go home for tea. Uh, you've got in your program uh, quite fulsome biographical notes of each of the speakers, so I don't propose to spend a lot of time telling you what you can already read in front of you, um, but just to point out one particular thing about uh, the speaker that we're having. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome Rose Hudson-Wilkin, who is what's called in the trade a prebendary of this cathedral, which means that she would have got paid if she'd been here 300 years ago, but now she does it for nothing, as well as being Speaker of the House of Commons. Um, and she's just about to move from her parish in Haggerston down to... Speaker. Sorry, oh, Speaker. Speaker's speaker chaplain. chaplain. Yeah. Terribly sorry. It's, wish, it's wishful thinking, Rose. Oh, yes, the reshuffle. Um, <laughs> We can but hope. Uh, Rose is going to be moving in the autumn from her parish in East London to St. Mary at Hill, which is a church uh, over just by the Tower of London in case she gets restive. Um, but she will be combining the city and Westminster together in one person, which we're delighted about. The other thing is, a couple of months ago, in one of the newspaper articles which was talking about the upcoming vote on women bishops, uh, there was a photograph which was captioned an Anglican priest, and it was a picture of Rose. And I think 
If the world thinks that an Anglican priest, Rose is an Anglican priest, we've really made some progress. Great. Rose, over to you. Women in leadership, what needs to change the moral imperative for equality in leadership. In 1851, Sojourner Truth delivered a speech at the Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. And I would like to quote from it for the purpose of tonight's event. Where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights. The white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches, and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages, or even mud puddles, or give me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and see most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's this they call it? Intellect. That's it. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. <laughs> if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it the right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The men had better let them. This speech by Sojourner Truth highlights something much more deeper and tangible than mere equality in leadership. The question, ain't I a woman, is not just a rhetorical question where one is wrestling within about a subject matter. It is a serious question for all who hear it to consider. It is morally incomprehensible that Sojourner and millions of people from the continent of Africa suffered such dehumanizing experiences. It is morally incomprehensible today that we are still having to hold summits to discuss the reality of modern day slavery over 200 years after the abolition of the Slave Trade Act. At the heart of this issue is the reality that the humanity of those who are enslaved was being totally disregarded. Those who abuse others treat them as objects, mere commodities to be used and disposed of according to one's desires. What other explanation could there be? You see, if you're not human like me, then you cannot possibly feel like I feel. You cannot possibly nurture hopes and dreams like I do. But how can they know those who are in, how those who are enslaved feel? Impossible, unless the other's humanity is recognized. 
thus enabling you to empathize, to place one's feet in another's shoes. This May I was in Ghana and was deeply disturbed when I visited the Cape Coast and saw with my own eyes the place where millions were taken through the gate of no return and placed on the ships to be taken to the new world. Below ground in caves, human beings were kept, and above ground, a church was built. I felt physically ill. My thoughts were, what possessed those who built the church to think that this could ever be acceptable? This was surely contrary to the faith. I'm therefore proposing that the real crisis which we face is not so much one of a lack of equality in leadership, but rather something much deeper than that. I believe it is a failure to respect the other's humanity, a failure to respect women as human beings, a failure to respect black people as human beings, people of minority ethnic background. It therefore naturally follows on that if I am not respected and valued as a human being, then what I bring to the table will also not be respected and valued. And it is because there is no respect and value at this level why there is therefore a resistance to even contemplate putting a woman or someone from a different ethnic origin in positions of leadership. When I went to my parish in Hackney over 16 and a half years ago, one of my church wardens made it very clear to me that she was not used to people like me in a leadership position. That's how I was brought up, she said. We must not underestimate the messages that we have learned from childhood and sometimes continue to learn in adulthood. Messages from traditions, from culture, from religion, and from political ideology. These messages about others being seen as less human than ourselves further gives us permission to treat them differently and often less favorably than we would expect ourselves to be treated. So we put women in the corner, we put them in the box, we say that it is okay for them to do the flowers, to clean the sanctuary area, but not to stand behind the altar. We need to think seriously about the messages underlying our actions. Instead of diversity being celebrated, we see a dissension into tribal warfare. We just have to look at some of the violent hotspots in our world to see expressions of this. While here in Britain we do not see much such tribal violence at such a level, what we see instead is expressions of inequality. Let's be under no illusion, however. Increased inequality can only lead to deep discontent within our community and within our society. Surely, we can already see evidence of this. For example, the riots that we have seen in the past. It is therefore a moral imperative for us to seek to live and work within a community, within a society, within a church where all and what they bring to the table is respected and valued. We cannot continue to live in the 21st century as though we are back in the day, as my children would say, of bygone days. I grew up in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and there I saw reflections of myself in all walks of life. Moving to Britain, I am somewhat saddened that those images are very rarely to be seen by the next generation. Little girls growing up in Britain must know that there are no ceilings, be it glass or ecclesiastical, that will prevent them from reaching whatever they perceive the top to be. This applies to children from all backgrounds. I was once doing some work in the potteries when I was told, we don't have any black people here because we only need skilled people. My response was, 
Were you born with the ability to make Wedgwood or were you trained? Black people are capable of being trained. And of course, women too, we are also capable of being trained. Every time it is said that we need to have more women or people from a minority ethnic background into positions of leadership, we hear, oh, but we need qualified people. The implication that women and minority ethnic people are not qualified. Well, surely, if they're not qualified, we need to ask questions of our educational institutions as to whether or not they're fit for purpose. The reality is, whether we like it or not, Britain is a diverse society. It is therefore imperative that the community in which we live see the diversity reflected in all walks of life. Women make up 51% of the population. Why then, as a society, do we think it is still acceptable for women to be treated as second-class citizens? Sadly, we have used religion and other cultural practices to maintain the status quo. As long as we continue to teach inequality to the next generation, con consciously or unconsciously, we will be perpetuating a kind of society that can only contribute to conflict in the long term. I wonder if you felt as sick as I did back in May when that story came out of Pakistan of the young woman stoned to death by her family near to the law courts and especially hearing the police officer say he did not know what was happening. And there are, of course, many other incidents, similar incidents like this. Last night, a young woman on the television was shot, all because she chose to marry someone else. Let us be clear, we will not be able to change overnight long-held prejudices and views that have been nurtured for a lifetime. What we can do, however, is take positive action. The kind of positive action that will ensure that the next generation embraces diversity. The kind of positive action that will see women respected and valued for who they are. The kind of positive action that will see women and people from a minority ethnic background sitting at the table and contributing fully to the life of FTSE 100 organizations, to the life of the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and of course, Westminster Parliament, and whatever other organizations you represent today. I would like to suggest that as parents bringing children into the world and nurturing them, we have a unique responsibility for, to influence them for good for the next generation, teaching them to value and respect others. I feel a deep sense of contentment when I'm in the midst of others who value me as a person. For those who do not, they actually get my Aretha Franklin thrust. R-E-S-P-C-T, <laughs> find out what it means to me. Last week I visited a shop in Victoria I asked to see the manager, this Victoria here in the city, by the way. I asked to see the manager and pointed out that I was disturbed to see images that did not reflect the society I lived in. In another business recently opened in Hackney, I again asked to see the proprietor and told her that I would be happy to use their establishment when I see images that tells me that I am welcomed there. Without the visible images of women or people from a minority ethnic background, we are sending a message about our lack of value, and this can leave a lasting legacy for generations to come. Let us then together commit ourselves in building the kind of legacy that will enable us to have a community and a society where men and women sit at the table, people from a minority ethnic background sitting at the table, people who are disabled sitting at the table, people from all different walks of life sitting at the table, all using their gifts to build the kind of world that we want to live in. And finally, 
Let me just say to us as women who have just had that amazing vote this week, let's not think that we have arrived. If our sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church are not there, then we have not yet arrived. If women in other parts of our world continue to be stoned or to have honor killings uh, on them, then we have not yet arrived. And it's no good us putting our hands up and says, we're okay. Men, you too, cannot be okay until you continue to journey with women to make sure that the changes necessary are there. I would like to end with a quote that is attributed to Martin, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Niemöller, I think is the pronunciation. In Germany, they came for the communist, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant, a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak. Together, let's go forward to make the changes that we need in our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose. We're going to move on now to Liz Bingham. Uh, Liz works for EY, which I gather is Ernst & Young, which I thought were accountants, but obviously do much more interesting things if you're the managing partner for talent. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, you know, my mum used to say to me, if you aim for the moon, you might hit the top of a tree. But even in all of her optimism for me and my future, I don't think she would ever have believed that I would be standing in this amazing um, building speaking to so many of you this evening. I'm in some ways dismayed, um, but also in some ways delighted to be here. Dismayed really because in the 33 years that I've been working in the city, really very little progress has been made on this agenda, or so it feels. And when you look at the world of business in the UK, still less than 6% of the FTSE 100 executive directors are women. Only a fifth of our members of parliament are women. In the 96 years, since women were allowed to take their seat in the Palace of Westminster. There have been fewer women MPs in 96 years than there are men currently sitting in the House. But I did say I am delighted to be here, and I am in equal measure delighted to be here, because it's events like this that recognize that we're on a journey, and we're on a journey together, as Rose has so eloquently said. It's events like these that enable collective views from different walks of life to be heard and for all of us to join hands from different perspectives and different experiences to drive forward on this agenda. And it's also events like this that I think enable us to just pause for a moment and reflect on the progress that has been made. And we've heard from Barbara and Rose already, this has been a sensational week and it's only Wednesday. <laughs> so we had at last the vote of the General Synod on, on Monday on the ordination of women bishops. We had the cabinet reshuffle yesterday. So waha, now we have 25% of the cabinet um, are female. Um, but over and above that, the redoubtable Ken Clark was interviewed on Radio 4 yesterday morning. And he said to John Humphreys, who was interviewing him, women are talented people. <laughs> <laughs> We've won over Ken, so is it... <laughs> I, th I still think it's perhaps a little too early to declare victory nonetheless. Um, 
particularly when you think that so much of the focus of attention um, yesterday on the cabinet reshuffle was on gender um, as opposed to skill set. And um, Nick Robinson on the BBC on the early evening news said it's fantastic, there haven't been any hiccups yet, oh, apart from one of the new women getting into the wrong car. So, you know, we still have a journey to progress um, on this agenda. And when we think about that, I think it is easy to get disheartened at times. Um, but to understand better the journey ahead of us, I think we need to reflect on the road that we have already traveled. I was a bit nervous about using this reference in this hallowed place. But thousands of years ago, the Old Testament set the scene for equality of men's work versus women's work. Leviticus valued man's work at 50,000 shekels and a woman's work at 30,000 shekels. <laughs> we have a bit of a problem. We're playing catch up. It took us 2,000 years, but in 1970 in the UK, we finally got the Equal Pay Act. But the Office of National Statistics has recently reported that at the current rate of change, on equal pay, it will be another 33 years, ladies and gentlemen, until we actually achieve that. So we're actually doing this for our daughters and our granddaughters, not for ourselves. And in fact, one of the problem uh, that Nick Robinson flagged in the late evening news yesterday was that the new leader of the House of Lords has actually paid less than her male predecessor, and the Tory party have had to top up her salary. So we've definitely got a long way to go. So I come from the world of business, and in my role, um, which, which I've held as, as managing partner for talent for the last three years, it's about getting business to pay attention. Um, and how do you get business to pay attention? Well, you know, you won't be surprised to know that you need to get a business case. And even that, though that might sound obvious, it's actually harder than you think. So we've done a lot of work at EY where we've really started to drill down into what does this mean for business? Because Rose is absolutely right, there is a moral imperative, but actually that doesn't really wash in the world of commerce where it's all about growth and money and profit. So what's the business case? Well, we looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of audit assignments, because David, yes, we are accountants. Um, not all that we do, but we are auditors. We looked at thousands of audit engagements globally. We looked at 5,000 audit engagements in the UK alone. And what we discovered was that the gender-balanced teams, so not all women, not all men, but gender-balanced teams, delivered projects and work for clients that was more profitable and of a better quality than teams that were either heavily outweighed by men or heavily outweighed by women. So this isn't about women good, men bad. This is about striking a balance. And if you don't believe me from an EY perspective, I'd like to also quote um, from the Credit Suisse Research Institute in 2012 issued their um, analysts' investment report. And they said in that, our analysis shows that it would on average have been better to have invested in corporates with women on their management boards than in those without. The business case is so compelling that you have to ask what the problem is. Why are we still talking about this? Well, I'm going to proffer three hypotheses to you. I think the problem lies in power. I think the problem lies with women themselves. And I think the problem lies with society. So let's look at each of those. And the historians amongst you will be well aware that those in power do not give it up easily. We wouldn't have had centuries or millennia of conflict if people in power gave up power easily. And whether you're talking about the world of business, or the church, or politics, those in power today are typically straight white men. And the problem with that is that that tends to drive exclusive behaviors, because there's a protectionism that goes on in order to preserve that power. And then you end up with groupthink, and that's a problem. 
Some time ago, at the beginning of the global financial crisis, a number of economists were heard to say that Lehman sisters would never have gone bust. <laughs> the first time I heard that, I was sitting next to one of my male partners, who rather snootily turned round and said to me, Lehman sisters would never have got off the ground. So after I put my killer heel into the top of his foot, <laughs> I pointed out that he'd actually proven the point, that balance would have arguably produced a better result for that bank. So we need to find a way to share power and share power nicely. And women have got to take responsibility for this. Research in the United States recently, um, they had researchers go out to thousands and thousands of seven-year-old boys and girls. And they asked these boys and girls, what do you want to be when you grow up? And 50% of the boys said either the President of the United States or an astronaut. And 50% of the girls said exactly the same thing. Those same researchers then went to thousands and thousands of 14-year-old boys and girls and asked the same question. And 50% of the 14-year-old boys said they either wanted to be President of the United States or an astronaut but only 20% of the girls said the same thing. So there's something going on, something in society, something in the way we educate our children, something in the way we parent our children that is eking away at the ambition and the confidence of these young women, young girls, to, to, to move them from a position of feeling that they could be all that they could be to actually starting to conform to some more stereotypes. And the role models that we all are in whatever walk of life we come from is so important. We need to lift as we climb through our own organizations. We need to encourage the next generation. We need to really truly help them to believe that they can be all and anything that they, they want to be. We need to talk to them as my mum talked to me about aiming for the moon and my, maybe hitting the top of a tree. And we need to continue to attend and support events like these where we can share ideas and work with one another to move the agenda. And then society. You know, society expects women and girls to behave in a particular way. Good girls don't ask. I remember being told that when I was growing up, good girls don't ask, and that translates into the workplace. I see it all over the workplace. Talented young women who've got their heads down, doing a brilliant job, working really hard, and hoping that somebody is going to notice. Whilst all around them, their male colleagues are doing less work, of a less quality, but are telling everybody that they're brilliant. So we need to ask. I actually observed this this afternoon at an EY event um, where we had a couple of hundred people in the room and we were serving, or refreshments were being served, and there was this long line of people waiting to, to line up for their Diet Coke. And it was all women. The men were just going around the side and helping themselves. You know, we're so compliant. We need to do a little less of that. But we do need help. And we need to hold to account the media in particular on this. If you think about world-class female leaders, I'll offer you up Hillary Clinton. She was absolutely vilified in the media. She was portrayed as violating the gender norms, whatever that means, violating the gender norms. She was described as being cold and calculating and hard and driven, as if all of these things were really bad things to be until she was interviewed um, and she broke down. Whereupon she was emotional, not fit for high office. She couldn't possibly put, uh, um, get her in as president. She wouldn't be able to cope. She's the, in the classic double bind. And it's the media that perpetuate this. And it's a real problem. There was um, a, a report issued last year um, on Hollywood movies, movie stars. And that report said that the female Hollywood stars were typically paid less than their male counterparts. They typically had fewer words to speak in movies, so they made less impact than their male counterparts. And they typically spent more time naked than their male counterparts. You know, it's all just wrong.
Now, in the, in the world of work, you know, what have we seen that works on this agenda? Well, absolutely relentless focus, relentless focus. If you get disheartened for a heartbeat, then the agenda will fall apart. So it's absolutely relentless focus and really paying attention to how you measure progress because what gets measured gets done. And particularly in, in my world of professional services, we love a metric. Um, you need to set targets, but set them with teeth. Make sure that there are consequences for missing those targets. You need some clever interventions. We need to recognize that women on their leadership journey require different things to men. And they require different interventions at different times in their life because often women will leave the workplace for a period to go and have families. And how do we intervene at that point to give them confidence on returning to the workplace and enabling their careers to continue to flourish? The importance of role models, I've mentioned it once, you know, cannot be underestimated. We need to live the values and the behaviors that we want to see in the business. And that means making some difficult decisions and calling out difficult behaviors um, and inappropriate behaviors when you see them. Because fundamentally, a better balance means better business. Diverse perspectives will help us deliver better problem solving, better innovation, and that will enable us to have a great deal more fun. And as Rosa said, we need men on the pitch as well. This isn't just about women, and I'm delighted to see a small number of men in the audience <laughs> this evening. But we need to work together on this um, in order to pull this off. We need to hold one another to account, but we also need to support one another where appropriate. We need to lift as we climb to bring on the next generation of talent, but to do that authentically, and to do that with passion, commitment, and compassion. Because remember, they won't care what you know until they know that you care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. It's time to be getting your questions together, so make sure you fill in your sheets. We need to be collecting some questions and do hand them in. Our lovely assistants in the long black frocks are going around collecting them up. We now come to Francis O'Grady. Francis, um, I was just reflecting on the fact it's just over a year ago since you became the first woman general secretary of the TUC. And I was reflecting on two just under a year ago. Um, just over a year ago, we had uh, the funeral for Baroness Thatcher just, just here. And one wonders about the magnitude of the achievements involved in both of those things. But I think that what you've done is a superb achievement in what's seen very much as a man's kind of world. And we look forward to hearing you tell us about what your perspective is that you bring to this. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and it is wonderful to be in a cathedral full of women and men who are changing the world um, and doing it at such an important time when, of course, we've had that historic vote from the General Synod. And I may be being typecast here, but I am, um, for a minute, the shop steward of the speaker's panel and I would like to hold up this magnificent tea, sh um, tea towel that says, a woman's place is in the House of Bishops. Fantastic. Um, now, I always like to be up front when I'm in a place such as this and confess, which is a giveaway, that I am not actively religious myself. In fact, I would describe myself um, as an ex-Catholic, although my mother denies that any such category exists. Um, but I really believe in the values that trade unions and many faith groups share, values of justice, compassion, solidarity, and, of course, equality. 
Now, it took 146 years before the trade union movement elected its first woman TUC general secretary, and uh, we certainly can't be accused of rushing things. Uh, but today, nearly a third of our trade union leaders are women, and for the first time in our history, our six million strong membership is 50-50 men and women. And unions do a great job, not just in winning new learning opportunities, better pay and safer workplaces. We, cru crucially, we give ordinary people an independent voice at work. And just as Rose was saying, we believe that people should be treated as human beings, not just human resources, and that ultimately we want to humanize work. But we are, of course, swimming against a great tide of high unemployment, falling living standards, and growing inequality. Over five million workers in Britain earn less than the living wage, and most of them are women. The gender pay gap is growing again, and women have borne the brunt of the government's austerity policies, that have seen nurseries closed, services damaged, and their jobs and wages cut. And in the private sector, job segregation still ghettoizes women too often into dead-end, low-paid, uh, zero-hours work. Now, I know that some argue that men and women have different roles to play but I know enough about the history of race segregation in the United States of America to be very, very skeptical of those who tell us, whether in the church or in the workplace, that somehow we can be separate and equal. So for all those women from different walks of life who have struggled so long to serve their faith alongside men on equal terms, I want to send my heartfelt support and congratulations. Now, I've been asked to talk a little about changing workplace cultures that limit women's participation or advancement. And when I was younger, I thought the main obstacle to women's advancement, maybe the answer was simple, it was men. Uh, we had, for example, a little campaign where we put stickers on the doors of male managers emblazoned with the immortal words from that classic Doris Day hit, Move Over Darling. Um, didn't quite work, and of course life is more complicated than that. But it is, more, it is very refreshing for me to be able to talk about the needs of millions of ordinary working women for a change, as so often the focus seems to be just about getting more women, a few more women, into the boardroom. And many ordinary women feel that swapping a few rich men for a few rich women at the top isn't going to change their lives. As a trade union officer once told me, most of her members find it hard enough to smash through the glass skirting board, never mind the glass ceiling. Nevertheless, I personally have supported quotas for women on boards, not least because I am fed up of being told by those who oppose quotas that board membership should be decided on merit as if all the men in our boardrooms got there on merit. As if top directors really merit their pay, which is now 180 times bigger than that of the average worker. And how would we ever know if anybody got there on merit anyway, given I'm not aware that any of these positions have ever been advertised? But I want to focus on those millions of working women whose talents are too often passed over. And I, like others, want to stress that many of these changes will benefit, that benefit women will benefit men too and indeed businesses, because when women rise, we all rise. My views are grounded in TUC policy, of course, but also in my own experience. I am a single parent, and my children are now grown up. 
but I do remember very vividly what it feels like to juggle a job and small children rushing around. That's what I really remember. I was always rushing uh, between work and the childminder, worrying about the bills and wanting to be a good mum and a good worker too. In fact, I can say with absolute confidence that however stressful the job of leading the TUC may be, it is nothing compared to the stress of bringing up two children on average, never mind low pay. Now, of course, I've now joined that age group of women who tend to be overlooked for promotion or training, who are judged, I like to think, by the lines on our faces rather than the length of our experience. And I think one of the reasons that older women are often put off from entering public life, for example, is that sometimes there seems to be more interest in how we look than what we do. When I first got elected, one unsympathetic newspaper uh, published a photo of me, not the best photo, with the crushing caption, O'Grady, colon, dreary. Um, and even a friendly journalist told me that my best quality was that I look ordinary, which is just the kind of accolade any more menopausal woman in her 50s really wants to hear. <laughs> And of course, older women are increasingly not just looking after grown-up children who can't afford to move out because rents are too high and uh, uh, buying home ownership is out of reach. We are also caring for our own elderly parents too. And that's why when it comes to changing workplace culture, I want to start by welcoming the new universal right to request flexible working, which um, not just parents, but all carers, and indeed all workers can benefit from. Although I have to say that I never thought I'd see the day as a trade unionist when workers had to be given legal permission merely to ask their boss a question. What we really need, of course, long term, is more paid time off for all carers, but including more generous maternity, paternity and paid parental leave so that mums and dads can make a real choice about sharing the care of their children. And more than that, more than that, we need fair taxes to fund our precious public services, like our nurseries, like care for the elderly and the disabled, so those who do care don't pay a high penalty. It would also help if just as we have in successful economies like Germany, those in Germany and Scandinavia, if men and women were encouraged to work our proper hours rather than see long hours and what we call presenteeism, where you have to put your jacket over the back of the chair, to see that as a necessary step to promotion or some kind of weird virility test. And that brings me to pay. I've already mentioned the issue of low pay and unequal pay. And I sometimes wonder what it says about our economy and our society when the skill of repairing a car is considered many times more valuable than that of caring for a child. In this country, we have one of the longest tails of low pay than in any other EU member state. And that disproportionately hurts women and it disproportionately hurts their families. Surely every worker in Britain, the sixth richest nation in the world, should be entitled to live and work in dignity. Surely every woman and every man should have the right to a living wage. And surely the government should lead by example by giving Whitehall cleaners, school dinner ladies and Britain's army of nurses, teachers and carers a decent pay rise. And let's... <laughs> a 
And let's go further. Let's end those systems of performance, so-called performance-related pay, that tend to favour the blue-eyed boys and encourage us, us all to collude in a kind of secrecy about our incomes. The TUC wants to see every employer be transparent about pay from top to bottom so that we can check that men and women are being treated fairly. So those are just some thoughts about how to make work better, which would be good for women, but ultimately good for men and good for businesses too. A culture that would encourage respect and dignity for all walk workers in all walks of life. Finally, I was asked to issue you with a challenge. As I said, the trade union movement is now 50-50, men and women. We are Britain's largest democratic membership movements, but I want more people to join and I want more women to lead. One of the most shocking statistics about Britain reported by Oxfam is that the five richest families in this country, between them, have more, mil more money than the 12 million poorest. In the end, the only way to create fairer workplaces, a fairer society, and a fairer world is if decent men and women join together and work together for an alternative to the unequal mess we're in. So my challenge to you is this. If you're not in a union, please sign up. If you are in a union, please get active. And if you are active, then I encourage you in the same way that people encouraged me, go for it, stand for election, stand for leadership, because together, I believe, we can change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. And now we come to Kerry, Kerry Goddard who's been engaged in tackling structural gender inequalities in various ways and with various employers. I think the Young Foundation is not to do with age, is it, but the name of its founder? But of course you are probably very young anyway. <laughs> Younger than me. Um, Kerry, we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, Thank you very much, and um, actually, I'm 42. <laughs> and I have to say, at 42, this is my first ever speaking gig in a church. <laughs> um, but, um, but thank you, anyway, and thank you so much, St Paul's Institute, um, for letting me in uh, with a microphone. Um, so, um, now, what I've been asked to talk to you about tonight, I mean, I have a background as, as a campaigner, um, and I was asked to kind of look at what is the role um, for campaigning um, for gender parity um, in terms of changing legislation and, and what is the limits of that. And because they asked me to do that, um, I will do. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to kind of give you a brief introduction to where I'm coming from on this um, or what's informed my thoughts on this question. Um, so currently, as David said, I currently work for the Young Foundation and uh, what we do is we try and harness the power of social innovation including disruptive social innovation, which I shall talk about more later, to tackle the root causes of inequalities that we have been speaking about tonight. Um, and tonight, the change I'm going to be advocating is that there needs to be a greater use of this social innovation in tackling the root causes of the current power imbalance we still see between men and women. But what is this social innovation um, of which we speak? Well, innovation, I think, um, despite the common belief, actually, is not always something entirely new. It's the process, in fact, of breaking down barriers between different existing ideas and approaches and combining them in exciting new hybrids or fusions. It sounds like MasterChef, doesn't it? But it's actually not. It's, it's social change. And I'm, I'm really excited to see that St. Paul's has invited the, the panel, I think, that reflects that tonight. Um, it's about thinking outside the box. And I think that's particularly relevant to our discussions this evening because the leadership box that we're talking about is still a very patriarchal one. Most people, when you talk about innovation, think about, oh, that's business, that's science. But there is this growing concept of social innovation. 
a type of innovation that seeks to create a more equal and a just society. And the idea that you can take the innovation process, mixing it up, different ideas, prototyping, testing it, scaling it, that could be applied to social change. And this is quite a new uh, idea. And these social innovations don't need to be a thing. They could be an idea or a principle, such as human rights, introduced by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. There could be a movement, such as the civil rights um, movement in America, which we heard about previously. Yes, they can be a piece of legislation, and innovation can be a piece of law. For example, look at the UK. We have a public sector equality duty, not the raciest title, but very important, which requires our government and all of our public bodies to pay, and this is important, due regard, due regard to equality between men and women and between other groups in all that they do, in making policies, in, in their practices, in their services. And this is still bedding in, I think, in the UK, it would be fair to say, but it, it puts us apart from other peer nations in making such an explicit requirement. A social innovation could be an organisation. Look at the transformative effect that the Open University had on our society, the transformative effect of the unions that France has spoken about. A social innovation can be a product. Consider the contraceptive pill. It has transformed the lives and the choices of millions of women. So social innovation clearly in itself is not new. But I think the term social innovation was only coined about a decade ago. And since then has acted as a basis for a growing movement. And this movement is drawing people in many, many walks of life. In the state, in business, in NGOs, in families, in communities, um, in the phone shops and the nail bars of Peckham, where I live. Um, into collective voluntary action to challenge the status quo and the authorities and the institutions that are upholding this. And the authorities I'm speaking about here are not only government, but the private sector and, of course, the church. So, of course, I have to join in the congratulations to the movement that has finally seen um, the agreement on women's bishops. And actually, we had, we had several women in the vestry earlier as well. And if you look on Twitter, we, we, we actually managed to get in there too. So thank you. Um, but all of this is happening, this move movement is happening in a context of major change for those who want to see greater equality. The traditional barriers between the state and the market are breaking down. We're seeing less talk of public spending, a lot more talk of social investments. And we talk of a social, not just a fiscal economy. Now, how this works out is yet to be seen. But I know that what does happen will depend on who and how this new social innovation movement is appropriated. Thus, this is a critical time for us who are concerned with gender equality. History has shown us that where we have been involved and where we have influenced these wider social movements, we have had great impact. But where we have not, they can regress previous gains. But how far is this new, brave new world of social innovation looking at the structural causes of gender inequality that underpin the lack of women in power we've been discussing tonight? Well, I would say not nearly enough yet. But the ideas and the resources of social innovation have huge potential that could be harnessed, and particularly the idea of disruptive social innovation. So what is this? A disruptive innovation is something that goes further than traditional innovation. It doesn't just seek to incrementally improve on the existing status quo. A disruptive innovation seeks to tackle and replace the incumbents of that status quo. Those incumbents could be people, they can be politicians, there can be an idea, the idea that women can't be astronauts or trade union leaders. They can be institutions such as an all-male church and they can be replaced. And it does this by providing a better alternative to that status quo that more people can benefit from. The incumbents are not taken out, they are phased out of relevance. But if we want this, or any kind of innovation, to do more for gender equality, we have to be clear on what the problems are. So St. Paul did ask me to tackle two particular myths, uh, which I shall talk about, um, about what these problems are. And in particular, they wanted me to talk about the idea that women don't want to be leaders, and that having children means it's difficult to have a successful career. So let's just start with this idea that women don't want to be leaders. Well. 
Clearly, many women do want to be leaders and are already leaders. And particularly, I suppose, as leadership is commonly understood, and I mean the long hours, the competitiveness, the aggressiveness, the public profile, and yes, the ball breaking. <laughs> but there are also women who want to be leaders, but not that type of leader, because we are not clearly all the same. These other women don't lack the confidence or the ability to lean in. They choose not to. Like many male leaders I know, who commonly, I don't know if you've seen this in meetings, happily sit right back, often with their legs quite akimbo. Um, and they don't, they don't feel the need to change their position to command authority or to be listened to. But of course, there is a powerful consideration to be given to the idea, um, which was coined by an amazing um, African feminist, that if you are not at the table, then you will be on the menu. <laughs> it has something to it. But there are many women also working to make that table behave better and by holding it to account from the outside. So the myth here is not that women, and indeed many men, don't want to be leaders. The myth is that there cannot be different types of leader, or that if you are a woman and a leader, your femaleness will be your most defining feature. Another myth I've been asked to talk about is um, the idea that women who have children can't have successful careers, and indeed men who are fathers, um, which has been discussed a bit more recently. But sadly, the first thing I want to say is I don't think this is entirely a myth. The evidence, which Francis spoke about, is that there clearly is still what we call a motherhood penalty. There are many examples, which I'm sure you will know, of practical and cultural barriers in the workplace if you have kids, or even if you don't, but people think you might have kids. <laughs> so it's not a myth that there are still barriers if you have children to success at work. But what is a myth is that there is no alternative, or that this is inevitable. What we have today are workplaces that are constructs. Pretty rooted and stubborn ones, but constructs nonetheless. And constructs can be dismantled. But we don't just want an extension, uh -uh, to put the women in. We want a complete remodeling. We need to dismantle this workplace house that Jack built, because we know it wasn't Jill, because the evidence suggests she was probably working to pay the mortgage and doing the cleaning. What we want is women sharing in the running of the house, but not having to do that in only narrow gender roles. Legislation has and can do more to help this, but we need to combine it with culture change. And we need campaigners working on both fronts, and inside and outside of the state and government. But on this question of the right balance, I want to start by saying I don't think it should be an either or. And as campaigners working in different ways, we need to spend less time saying our way is the one true light and respect each other's different roles in what is, after all, a common vision of gender parity. But to the rule of the law, it is key that the principle of gender equality cuts across all of our legislation and that there is a clear direction on how to move from these lofty principles in law to change practice on the ground. That's why it's so important that the UK keeps its public sector equality duty and makes it easier to implement. Our equality and our human rights acts need to be promoted and built on, not diminished or disregarded. The reality is the law does support changes in culture and practice. Now, sometimes it just consolidates what's already been going on. I mean, look at gay marriage recently. You know, I think that was the case of the law finally catching up where the rest of us have got to about 10 years ago. But sometimes it must lead the way. And Francis talked about equal pay, and it's interesting, a little bit history about the Equal Pay Act. So the government initially wanted to bring it in early in 1971, but they got lobbied by the employers, and they said, no, 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 you don't need that. We can do this, voluntary action, give us three years. So they did. And in three years, they did nothing. So actually, it wasn't until the Equal Pay Act came in that it forced a discussion, and it forced employers and others to start to make the changes that we take for granted now. But of course, um, there's still much more change that we do need in equal pay. We still need more reform, because at the moment, the whole kind of equal pay law relies on individual women to take action against their employers after they've been discriminated against, but like closing the door after the horse has bolted. Reform should place greater expectation on employers to take preventative action 
A simple step would just be to implement pay transparency. Check you are paying men and women the same, and if not, do something about it. Disruptive, yes, disruptive to the incumbent idea that it is somehow women's job to ensure that they get paid fairly. Another oft debated area of law is quotas, though it sometimes feels a bit like a catch-22, um, whichever side you're on. So those um, who would argue for quotas um, look to the evidence that they work. There is no country on this planet that has achieved parity or even 30% women without special temporary measures. Newer democracies have quotas and gender balances built into their systems because they are constructing new playing fields and they choose to try and build them level. But there are, of course, many vocal voices, including many vocal women's voices, who are against quotas. These women, quite understandably, want to succeed and show that they can on the existing terms of engagement. They seem to have accepted the idea, which was on a postcard on my mum's wall when I was growing up, who was a teacher, bringing up three children, that you have to work six times as hard and do three times better than a man if you are to succeed as a woman. I understand why they want to prove this, and I am certainly constantly powerfully inspired by the women who do compete with men on equal terms, on equal terms all the time, and invariably do better. But again, I ask, why the either or? Change takes time and needs different approaches. Steps, it needs steps that allow women to compete within the status quo whilst it remains, and steps to dismantle and change this longer term. But attitudinal change, which is the last speak about, is also key. Laws alone cannot change people's minds. Movements are needed to shift social and cultural norms. We must not wait for legal change. In fact, often they precede it. They can be initiated by small campaigning groups or spontaneous uprisings that you just can't create. But you can create conditions to make them flourish. I agree with so many of our other speakers. We need to look at the whole life cycle. We need to start when girls and boys are very young and all of the systems and experiences they go through which form their expectations of their own gender and the opposite gender. We need to recognize the many actors needed for this change. Teachers, parents, workers, kids, our current political and business leaders. They can all play a role to change one small thing or one big thing. Which brings me, Chair, to my concluding remarks. Should you be getting edgy? Because <laughs> I am the last speaker. Nearly there. Um, and again, where I should attempt, as asked, to pick one key thing I thought would help change things, or indeed can be disrupted. And I have um, also settled on the idea of merit, or at least merit as we currently know it. I think we need to change the status quo that says a woman leader cannot value herself or be valued by those around her unless she has got there on merit. Now, my problem is not leadership based on merit per se. It's about how narrowly we currently view what merit is and who is defining it. So fine, let women become leaders on merit, but not a merit defined and upheld by a, upheld by a small group of elite male leaders who want to reproduce the exclusionary and self-interested cliques, but a merit that is more inclusive. In his 1954 book, Michael Young, after whom the Young Foundation is named after, um, wrote a book, and it was called The Rise of the Meritocracy. And uh, you've probably heard the word meritocracy. It's something a lot of our politicians now are clamoring to say that's what we want to create. Perhaps if they'd read Michael Young's book, they might not be so quick to associate with this idea of meritocracy. Because what Michael Young predicted was a dystopia a society where people were divided into class according to a very narrow set of intellectual and other abilities. A society and an economy crumbling under the weight of its growing inequality in 1954. In this book, interestingly, the revolt against this system of merit that still divides everybody is led by women. And, of course, they are supported by members of the ruling intelligentsia and powerful elite who have become very uncomfortable in what their power means for other people in society. And they hook up and they kind of start a big movement. It's a good book. But I just wanted to kind of read a couple of lines from their manifesto in this, in this fictional book. Um, 
And it says, were we to evaluate people not only according to their intelligence and education, their occupation and their power, but according to their kindness and courage, their imagination and their sensitivity, their sympathies and their generosity, there would be no classes. Who would be able to say that the scientist was superior to the porter who had admirable qualities as a father? The civil servant with skill at winning prizes superior to the lorry driver with skill at growing roses. Every human being would then have equal opportunity not to rise up in the world in light of any mathematical measure, but to develop in their own special, special capabilities for leading a rich life. I think there's something in that for us today. So my challenge is we should take down the idea of man-made merit. We should use both legislation and culture change and replace it with an idea where there is merit in difference, not only sameness, compromise, not only competition, imagination, not only evidence, creating and nourishing a new life and children, as well as new Game Boy acts and hydron colliders. And that there is merit both in caution as well as unwavering commitment that your plan will work, which I know well. And to be clear that none of, most importantly, to be clear that none of these merits can only belong to men or only belong to women. And yes, let's keep campaigning in law and culture to get more women into the leadership systems as they stand. But at the same time, let's innovate to change these systems themselves. Let's provide an alternative to the status quo where being male alone gives you merit. I am sure on this panel and in this room and out there will be many views on how to get here. But I hope there is one thing we can all agree on. Those current incumbent leaders who resist sharing greater power with women in their own self-interest can no longer do this with impunity. Change is inevitable, it will come, but it will come much more quickly if, as a movement, we can combine our differences and lead, not wait for others to deliver the innovation that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. We're going to be able to have two groups of questions. The first three questions to the microphone, please, are Nick Dyson, Ermi Bahan, and Rachel Draper. If you'd like to go to the mic in the middle there. Uh, just as they're doing that, very quick question from Kirsty Palmer on Twitter. How can we ensure that women are educated properly when leadership is so very male? Liz. Um, goodness. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think that's, that's quite a, um, a deep question, um, and I'm, I, I guess I'm a bit, I'm not, I'm not personally drawing the um, a, a direct line of sight between education and male leadership, um, but I think there is something for educators to consider in this, in the same way as there is something for parents to, to consider in this, um, and for all of us, as I think all of, all of the panel have spoken about. Um, so it, I, I apologize for not being able to draw that complete correlation between male leadership and um, ensuring that women are educated. But I am, of course, only talking about um, the UK when I say that. And there are obviously far, far greater issues in countries outside of these shores in terms of young girls getting an education. Um, and that is something that we also need our government on the pitch to help us resolve. Okay, thank you very much. Can we ask um, Nick first for your question, please? Hi there, it's uh, Nick Dyson. I'm head of sixth form at Burgess Hill School for Girls in Sussex. Um, my question is, I sit in the audience with eight female sixth formers. One of Liz Bingham's hypotheses questioned whether women were doing enough being sufficiently resilient. By the age of 30, sick formers can expect to have had 12 to 15 different jobs. What advice would you give in this transient marketplace? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Ermi? Um, can you provide an example of when prejudice against females stood in the way of your leadership and how did you deal with it? Okay, thank you. And Rachel? 
Um, my question is, uh, you've all been incredibly successful reaching the positions that you have. Do you feel that in doing so, you've made any sacrifices to get there? Um, and if so, upon reflection, would you have done anything differently if you could do it all again? Wow, look at that lot. Okay. First one, Liz. Sorry, I'm coming back to you. That was directed in your direction. So, so uh, the, the question was what advice um, to give in... Uh, in a transient um, workplace? Um, yeah, it, I think that's a great question. Um, I think whether you have a single job for life, which is mo more and more unusual these days, or whether you have multiple um, jobs, I think there, there are still sort of basic tenets to follow. Um, so there's something ar around being very authentic um, in terms of how you operate with people around you um, in whatever walk of, of life that, that you are. So there's an honesty and an openness there. Um, there's linked to, th to that um, EQ and emotional intelligence, which is about understanding your place in the world, whether that's the world of work or, or otherwise, and, and how, you know, what impact you're having on others. And I think there's also something about you know, being really practical, um, having a practical intelligence that, um, that means that you can uh, be as successful um, as the opportunity presents itself to you, regardless of, of what your role is. Um, and I think all, you know, I say to you know, our folk at EY, you know, to consider this as a notion, to only consider moving from one employer to another employer when you've exhausted all opportunities that are available to you with your existing employer. And for goodness sake, be open about your ambition, your desires. Don't expect that people are going to um, be able to read your minds or, or make, make suppositions about where you want to be, the kinds of experiences that, that you need. Um, and I think, you know, over the years, we seem to have um, moved away from a, a, um, a, an environment where people feel confident to be a bit demanding, and I think we need to get that demand back into uh, the workplace. Um, so that's the demand from the employer ease to the employer. Thank you very much. Um, Francis, what prejudice stood in your way and how did you deal with it? <laughs> how long have we got? <laughs> Not very long at all. No, I, was gonna I was gonna just tell you about one little incident that made me laugh was, um, I went to Davos this year, the um, kind of uh, conference for the rich and powerful, and um, there was a lot of press comments because um, David Cameron was speaking, and I sat in the audience and managed to be get um, invited to ask a question. One of three people. I, I, in some ways, I feel sorry for David Cameron. Actually, he's gone all the way to Davos, and who pops up? <laughs> Anyway, he, to be fair to him, which isn't a phrase I often use, but to be fair to him, it was quite dark. And so he said, um, the lady in red. Anyway, so you can imagine in the press that he got a bit of stick for, you know, is that how you refer to the general secretary of the TUC and how come you didn't recognize her and so on. Um, actually, I, I didn't think it was so much sexism. I was more worried about his taste in music. But um, the, the key tip I would want to give um, to all, that was given to me and I've sort of kept throughout my life is that you should always have... Uh, women who are older than you and women who are younger than you. So take the wisdom of women above you in the age range and um, take their support and everything they've learned and learn from them, but also very consciously pass it on. Identify uh, younger women who need help and support informally and build that network, I suppose, build that ladder. And I think if we all did that, uh, we might get a bit further on. We have to, in the end, I just believe, I believe in solidarity in all its forms. I think we have to support each other and back each other uh, and share in the joy, but also support each other sometimes when it's tough and we need to do that in a more organized way. Okay, thank you. Can I ask Claire Tillotson, please, to go to the microphone? Claire Tillotson. And uh, Rose, uh, sacrifices to be made and what you might um, do differently? 
what are the sacrifices that I've made um, to get to where I am? I think uh, shortly after I was ordained, I had surgery on my knee. And it was a day surgery. And I got my husband, after I got out of hospital the next day, to drive me to my parish. And I hobbled around in the parish with a walking stick because I was determined. This is a parish that didn't want me. Everywhere I go, they don't want me. But that's okay. And I hobbled around with my walking stick for, a, for several days because I was determined that they were not going to say, see, she's a woman, she can't hack it or she is black, she can't hack it. So the sacrifice of not staying home and uh, being well before going back to work. And the other sacrifice, I think, is that I spend a lot of time traveling around, going to all sorts of places around the country, in particular to schools, because I want young girls to be able to say, if she can do that, then I can do it too. Thanks, Rose. Thank you. Okay, Claire, this, this is a question for Kerry. Whatever it is, Kerry's going to answer it. <laughs> As a student, I feel like it's necessary for me to s decide now what to prioritise my life around, career or family. What would you recommend for women who want to have both and to succeed in both? Um, well, as you heard from my speech, I'm not an either-or kind of gal, um, so I'm, I'm really delighted, actually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to feel that you feel pressured, that you have to choose, um, and I would say that you don't. Um, I think my um, practical advice would be do a job that you love and makes you happy. Because when you are happy, you continue to see your friends and go out and be a normal person. And then you meet nice people. Um, and then if you meet nice people, you might meet a partner and eventually you might have the baby too. I think the point is that work-life balance is not, um, you know, it's often talked about in a very kind of dowdy, political way, but actually work-life balance is what we all need as human beings. And you will not be the full human being you can if you deny either your ability to create new life or, you know, have a family if that's what you want and have a social life and also, be, you know, also, um, you know, contribute to the workplace. You know, we're not separate. We're all, we're all the one thing. So my practical advice is make you do something you love. Don't go out with somebody for too long who you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Time has defeated us, sadly, but uh, we're going to go now to Shami Chakrabarti. Shami is Director of Liberty. Shami, thank you so much for coming along to be with us this evening. And you're going to offer us, <laughs> offer us a reflection and a challenge. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, what, a, what a wonderful evening. Um, I, um, I had to come a little later, but I, I did have the, the privilege of hearing the, the, the great contributions um, from, from the panel and indeed the, um, the questions and, and, and brilliant, witty, pithy, wise responses to, to, to those questions. And I have to just add my, um, add my praise of the great decision that the Church of England has made this week, 2,000 years of prejudice overturned. That doesn't happen every week, so can we just celebrate that one more time, please? <laughs> now, as, you, as you've heard, I'm the Director of Liberty. That's the National Council for Civil Liberties, um, this country's domestic campaign for human rights, for fundamental rights and freedoms for everyone. In, in this country, and indeed this country as part of a shrinking interconnected world where we have to really decide whether we want to be um, nationals in a tiny speck of the planet or human beings everywhere. And, um, and, and I, I listened to everything that the panelists said, in, including Liz's um, um, praise for the, the extra women 
in, in, in government as a result of, uh, of yesterday's cabinet reshuffle. Though I have to also add my concern that um, some significant friends of human rights appear no longer to, to sit in, that, in, in that, cap, uh, that cabinet. And whatever you want to say about Ken Clark, a, a, a defender of human rights, the Attorney General Dominic Grieve, another bloke, but a great defender of, of human rights. And indeed, William Hague as, as Foreign Secretary was a voice for, um, for human rights, not least um, for, for, for those of women. So it's a mixed, I think it's a mixed blessing. So yes, great, 25% of the cabinet, but I'm concerned about the debate um, surrounding human rights in this country at this moment in time. And um, I am, in addition to being the Director of Liberty, or perhaps because of it, the woman who was once described by the Sun newspaper as the most dangerous woman in Britain. <laughs> yeah. And um, that should either make you very afraid or, as I can tell from your response, realise that actually Britain, you know, if you look at the world in the round, it's actually not that dangerous um, a place. And, um, and, um, and, you know, the Sun newspaper, there's a, there's a, great, um, a great place for gender equality. But, um, but the, the, the person who called me the most dangerous woman in Britain um, was actually a man um, by the name of John Gaunt, who, um, who had a problem with human rights until until he was sacked from being a shock jock, if you know what, you look like Radio 4 people to me, forgive me, but, um, but um, if you listen to other stations like Talk Sport Radio, there's a phenomenon that's been imported from the United States called a shock jock who, who shouts at people over the radio in, in heated political debate and then slams the phone down on them on occasion. But it's, it's all good stuff, it's all good debate. And, um, and he had a row with a, with a, with a local politician and um, got sacked, summarily sacked. Um, from his job with no warning and no fair process. And now he has a case pending in the European Court of, uh, of Human Rights, um, um, in which my Liberty colleagues are assisting, you'll understand. Um, which I think um, makes a point about, um, a really important point about human rights, because in truth, whatever nonsense people speak on occasion about human rights, we all love human rights, our own right? It's, it's other people's that are a little bit of a problem. So, so right now, just for a few more minutes, I promise my speech is free and yours is a tad more expensive. And that, that's, that, that's a sort of common refrain when it comes to, 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 to critics of, of human rights. And, and I don't see, um, like Kerry and some of the other, the, the other wonderful speakers that we've heard from, I don't see um, human rights in, in very complex or desperately clever philosophical or legal terms. I, I see them really quite simply. And I would sum up human rights, which is what I think we should all be about, um, with three words. Dignity, equality, and fairness. And the greatest of these is, of course, equality. Because um, there wouldn't be torture, and there wouldn't be slavery, and there wouldn't be um, grave privacy intrusions or suppressions of free speech and free elections anywhere in the world if we really if we really upheld the value of equality all over the planet because as I said we all love fundamental rights and freedoms but those those of our own and those of our families and those for people like us and, and, and not for everyone else. And so the principle of equality is the greatest discipline in any, in any great civilization, especially a democracy, because it forces us to imagine what it, be, what it would be like to be the other, to be the person who is for the time being oppressed and forgotten and cast aside. And so how particularly strange it seems to me that gender injustice, in my view, is the greatest and deepest and oldest injustice and human rights violation on the planet. How strange when there are families all over the planet of men and women women have fathers and husbands and lovers and sons and yet gender injustice is so ingrained. I would say it is an apartheid that goes back thousands of years, almost to the beginnings of humanity, and is so entrenched 
all over the planet. And that is the position. And that is the position even under the Millennium Goals. That is the position in Britain and everywhere else to some degree or another. And of course, Eleanor Roosevelt, who's already been cited at least, at least once in the remarks that I've heard, was the, the grandmother of international human rights. And she described human rights famously as beginning in small places close to home. Places so small and so close that they can't be seen on any, any map of the world, and yet they are the world of the individual person. And in my view, she was so right. We're talking about human rights violations like the too many women still in parts of the developing world in particular who die in childbirth for no, for no necessary reason other than, other than maternal care has not been prioritized by those in power. And we're talking about women who are still subject to domestic violence all over the world, including in our country and in this city. And we're talking about the injustices of every workplace and every boardroom and our parliament chamber and our cabinet table. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. So if human rights begin in small places close to home, so do the violations of human rights. And until we tackle this injustice in our families and our friendship circles and in our workplaces as well as with legislation and, and great political polemic, we will go no further. And if I'm honest, I think that, um, that my generation, those of us in our sort of grumpy mid to late 40s, have got a lot to answer for. And I think that our mothers and, and some of the feminists who came before us might be looking down and saying, you didn't really, you didn't really do enough. You know, you kind, of, you kind of took your feet off the pedal just a little bit. I don't think that the Pankhursts would be so proud of the Chakrabartis on this issue of gender injustice right now. And I intend to, to try and do something about it um, in, in the various ways that the speakers um, suggested before before my time is up, and we need to do more in healthcare and education and work and pay and politics and the professions and even the courts. You know, in the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, there is still only one woman, and there has only been one woman, and that is Baroness Hale of Richmond, just as we've only just had the first woman General Secretary of the TUC. And aren't we proud to have just heard from Francis O'Grady? Yeah, let's, let's do it again for Francis O'Grady. <laughs> So I may not be the most dangerous woman in Britain, but on occasion, you know, other less flattering columnists have referred to me as the, perhaps the, the grimmest or the, or the, you know, the doerest or the grumpiest woman in Britain. I, I don't want to be that, but I am impatient for change. And that does mean that I have changed my mind in my adult life on things like affirmative action or quotas or whatever. I have changed my mind. Because, you know, when I, was, when I was young and perhaps on occasion a little cocky and even naive, I, I assumed that I was going to do everything um, on this idea of merit that actually wasn't merit at all. And then I first did this job and I first, um, I first had the privilege of a platform on the public stage and I appeared on national television occasionally and people said, she's only there because she ticks various boxes, you know. And after a while, I thought, well, maybe I got invited on Question Time for the first time because people do want to, to use their colour TV. You know, it's a bit boring otherwise. To... <laughs> or even black and white requires two shades. You know what I mean? It's kind of, you don't even have to go, you know, to go. But, 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 um, but I'm not so inarticulate. And I kind of, you know, earned my invitation back. And I started changing over time my idea of what merit was and realizing that the status quo was not a meritocracy. And now when people say, Shami, are you worried? Are you worried when you get invited to do various jobs and various gigs that you might be a token? I now say, no, 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 I don't, I, I don't worry too much. I think I'm um, not so much a token as a beacon. Right? And, and in the end, I agreed with pretty much everything that I heard 
on this panel tonight, but I think particularly Francis's words about solidarity. There's an old-fashioned word of the left, eh? Solidarity. Uh, but but, in, but in, in, the, in the Christian church, there's a very similar concept, and it's fellowship, right? And it's the idea that, that we should come together. We should unashamedly come together and support each other as active agents for change. Not be in competition all the time, but in collaboration and do, as, as Francis suggested, pass, you know, pass it on, pass the wisdom and the support and the encouragement that we, who have now come to our middle years perhaps, if you do the maths, possibly a little more than the middle years, but we don't have to, we don't have to go there, even though we're in a place of God, you understand? Um, so solidarity and fellowship, whatever you want to call it, I think are incredibly important if we are to free men as well as women from these terrible injustices and, and unnatural uh, apartheids, really, that still, that still shackle the, the human race. Now, I've, I've, you know, I've sucked up to Francis enough, so, so let me, let me think of another um, another great woman trade unionist who um, who perhaps Shami, deserves. I'm afraid that we need to be drawing to a close. Right, I'm, I'll, okay. I'll do that. I'll do that straight away. I'll okay. draw to a close. But but Thanks. but uh, I have to praise another great woman trade unionist first, who has been. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's nice to be shut up by a very nice man rather than a horrible man, you understand, always, right. So, um, so very briefly, I've just, written a, I've just read a brilliant um, biography of a, a great woman trade unionist called Eleanor Marks. Right? It's a wonderful new biography by a feminist historian called Rachel Holmes. And Eleanor Marx, did you know, not enough people do, was the youngest daughter of Karl Marx. Right? Everybody knows Karl Marx, but, but not enough people know Eleanor Marx, who was the youngest daughter, and, and she was um, his editor and collaborator and translator and a great woman of the arts as well as of activism and feminism and internationalism. And what you need to know about Eleanor Marx um, and her cohort is that modern feminism didn't begin in the 1970s, it began in the 1870s. And she was a founder of the GMB, I think the, uh, the largest trade union um, that we have in this country. She struggled to get women recognized as skilled workers in that, in that union, believe it or not, because even the unions, dare I say, at Francis haven't always been, in, yeah, haven't always been completely enlightened. And she, I'm going to end with some short remarks um, from a speech that she made at the first May Day rally in 1890, because I was told to end with a flourish to get you all going before you, you go forth and multiply, right? <laughs> Not by yourselves, you understand. Um, and this is, this is what she said. She was campaigning, amongst other things, in 1870 for an eight-hour working day for, for, for men and women. And this is, this is how she ended her speech. Eleanor Marx in 1870. This is not the end, but only the beginning of the struggle. It's not enough to come here to demonstrate in favor of an eight-hour day. We must not be like some Christians who sin for six days and go to church on the seventh. Surely not. But we must speak for the cause daily and make the men and especially the women that we meet come into the ranks to help us. And then finally, she quoted Shelley's Mask of Anarchy, this wonderful, wonderful final flourish. She read, Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable numbers. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Shami. And it's now over to you. If you've been inspired, uh, if you want to do something about it, if you want to begin answering those how questions, on your way out to the back, take a selfie, go and talk to some of the organizations who you'll find at the back on the back of your program who can help you answer those how questions and how you do do it in solidarity. And uh, do give some money to Girl Talk to encourage role models for young women in the future. Thank you for being with us. And thank you particularly to our panel, to Kerry, to Liz, to Francis, and to Rose. Thank you very much. Well
well done, guys.